the long arm by richard harding davis this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by caroline the long arm the safe was an old one that opened with a key as adjutant captain swanson had charge of certain funds of the regiment and kept in the safe about five thousand dollars no one but himself and ruff his first sergeant had access to it and as ruff proved an alibi the money might have been removed by an outsider the court-martial gave swanson the benefit of the doubt and a reprimand for not taking greater care of the keys and swanson made good the five thousand swanson did not think it was a burglar who had robbed the safe he thought ruff had robbed it but he could not possibly prove that at the time of the robbery ruff was outside the presidio in uniform at a moving-picture show in san francisco a dozen people saw him there besides ruff held an excellent record he was a silent clerk-like young man better at paper-work than campaigning but even as a soldier he had never come upon the books and he had seen service in two campaigns and was supposed to cherish ambitions towards a commission but as he kept much to himself his fellow non coms could only guess that on his captain's account he was loyally distressed over the court-martial and in his testimony tried to shield swanson by agreeing heartily that through his own carelessness the keys might have fallen into the hands of some one outside the post but his loyalty could not save his superior officer from what was a verdict virtually of not proven it was a most distressing affair and on account of the social prominence of swanson's people his own popularity and the name he had made at batangas and in the boxer business was much commented upon not only in the services but by the newspapers all over the united states every one who knew swanson knew the court-martial was only a matter of form even his enemies ventured only to suggest that overnight he might have borrowed the money meaning to replace it the next morning and the only reason for considering this explanation was that swanson was known to be in debt for he was a persistent gambler just as at perkin he had gambled with death for his number in times of peace he gambled for money it was always his own money from the start swanson's own attitude towards the affair was one of blind unreasoning rage in it he saw no necessary routine of discipline only crass ignorant stupidity that any one should suspect him was so preposterous so unintelligent as to be nearly comic and when instantly he demanded a court of inquiry he could not believe it when he was summoned before a court-martial it sickened wounded deeply affronted him turned him quite savage on his stand his attitude and answers were so insolent that his old friend and classmate captain copley who was acting as his counsel would gladly have kicked him the findings of the court-martial that neither cleared nor condemned and the reprimand were an intolerable insult to his feelings 
and in a fit of bitter disgust with the service and every one in it swanson resigned of course the moment he had done so he was sorry swanson's thought was that he could no longer associate with any one who could believe him capable of theft it was his idea of showing his own opinion of himself and the army but no one saw it in that light on the contrary people said swanson has been allowed to resign in the army voluntarily resigning and being allowed to resign lest greater evil befalls are two vastly different things and when it was too late no one than swanson saw that more clearly his anger gave way to extreme morbidness he believed that in resigning he had assured every one of his guilt in every friend and stranger he saw a man who doubted him he imagined snubs rebuffs and coldness his morbidness fastened upon his mind like a parasite upon a tree and the brain sickened when men and women glanced at his alert well set up figure and shoulders that even when he wore sits seemed to support epaulets and smiled approvingly swanson thought they sneered in a week he longed to be back in the army with a homesickness that made every one who belonged to it his enemy he left san francisco where he was known to all and travelled south through texas and then to new orleans and florida he never could recall this period with clearness he remembered changing from one train to another from one hotel to the next nothing impressed itself upon him for what he had lost nothing could give consolation without honour life held no charm and he believed that in the eyes of all men he was a thief a pariah and an outcast he had been in cuba with the army of occupation and of that beautiful island had grown foolishly fond he was familiar with every part of it and he believed in one or another of its pretty ports he could so completely hide himself that no one could intrude upon his misery in the states in the newspapers he seemed to read only of those places where he had seen service of those places and friends and associates he most loved in the little cuban village in which he would bury himself he would cut himself off from all newspapers from all who knew him from those who had been his friends and those who knew his name only to connect it with a scandal on his way from port tampa to cuba the boat stopped at key west and for the hour in which she discharged cargo swanson went ashore and wandered aimlessly the little town reared on a flat island of coral and limestone did not long detain him the main street of shops eating-houses and saloons the pretty residences with overhanging balconies set among gardens and magnolia trees were soon explored and he was returning to the boat when the martial music of a band caused him to halt a side street led to a great gateway surmounted by an anchor beyond it swanson saw lawns of well-kept grass regular paths pretty cottages the two-starred flag of an admiral and rising high above these like four eiffel towers the gigantic masts of a wireless 
he recognized that he was at the entrance to the key west naval station and turned quickly away he walked a few feet the music of the band still in his ears in an hour he would be steaming toward cuba and should he hold to his present purpose in many years this would be the last time he would stand on american soil would see the uniform of his country would hear a military band lull the sun to sleep it would hurt but he wondered if it were not worth the hurt a small sergeant of marines in passing cast one glance at the man who seemed always to wear epaulettes and brought his hand sharply to salute the act determined swanson he had obtained the salute under false pretences but it had pleased not hurt him he turned back and passed into the gate of the naval station from the gate a grass-lined carriage drive led to the waters of the harbour and to the wharfs at its extreme end was the band stand flanked on one side by the cottage of the admiral on the other by a sail loft with iron barred windows and whitewashed walls upon the turf were pyramids of cannon balls and laid out in rows as though awaiting burial one time muzzle loading guns across the harbour the sun was sinking into the coral reefs and the spring air still warm from its caresses was stirred by the music of the band into gentle rhythmic waves the scene was one of peace order and content but as swanson advanced the measure of the music was instantly shattered by a fierce volley of explosions they came so suddenly and sharply as to make him start it was as though from his flank a quick firing gun in ambush had opened upon him swanson smiled at having been taken unawares for in san francisco he often had heard the roar and rattle of the wireless but never before had he listened to an attack like this from a tiny white and green cottage squatting among the four giant masts came the roar of a forest fire one could hear the crackle of the flames the crash of the falling tree trunks the air about the cottage was torn into threads beneath the shocks of the electricity the lawn seemed to heave and tremble it was like some giant monster bound and fettered struggling to be free now it growled sullenly now in impotent rage it spat and spluttered now it lashed about with crashing stunning blows it seemed as though the wooden walls of the station could not contain it from the road swanson watched through the open windows of the cottage the electric bolts flash and flare and disappear the thing appealed to his imagination its power its capabilities fascinated him in it he saw a hungry monster reaching out to every corner of the continent and devouring the news of the world feeding upon tales of shipwreck and disaster lingering over some dainty morsel of scandal snatching from ships and cities two thousand miles away the thrice told tale of a conflagration the score of a baseball match the fall of a cabinet the assassination of a king 
in a sudden access of fierceness as though in an ecstasy over some fresh horror just received it shrieked and chortled and then as suddenly as it had broken forth it sank into silence and from the end of the carriage drive again rose undisturbed the music of the band the musicians were playing to a select audience on benches around the band stand sat a half dozen nursemaids with knitting in their hands the baby carriages within arm's length on the turf older children of the officers were at play and up and down the path bareheaded girls and matrons and officers in uniform strolled leisurely from the vine-covered cottage of admiral preble set in a garden of flowering plants and bending palmettos came the tinkle of teacups and the ripple of laughter and at a respectful distance seated on the dismantled cannon were marines in khaki and blue jackets in glistening white it was a family group and had not swanson recognized among the little audience the others of the passengers from the steamer and natives of the town who like himself had been attracted by the music he would have felt that he intruded he now wished to remain he wanted to carry with him into his exile a memory of the men in uniform of the music and pretty women of the gorgeous crimson sunset but though he wished to remain he did not wish to be recognized from the glances already turned toward him he saw that in this little family gathering the presence of a stranger was an event and he was aware that during the trial the newspapers had made his face conspicuous also it might be that stationed at the post was some officer or enlisted man who had served with him in cuba china or the philippines and who might point him out to others fearing this swanson made a detour and approached the band stand from the wharf and with his back to the hawser post seated himself upon the string-piece he was overcome with an intolerable melancholy from where he said he could see softened into shadows by the wire screens of the veranda admiral preble and his wife and their guests at tea a month before he would have reported to the admiral as the commandant of the station and paid his respects now he could not do that at least not without inviting a rebuff a month before he need only have shown his card to the admiral's orderly and the orderly and the guard and the officer's mess and the admiral himself would have turned the post upside down to do him honour but of what avail now was his record in three campaigns of what avail now was his medal of honour they now knew him as swanson who had been court-martialed who had been allowed to resign who had left the army for the army's good they knew him as a civilian without rank or authority as an ex-officer who had robbed his brother officers as an outcast his position as his morbid mind thus distorted it tempted swanson no longer for being in this plight he did not feel that in any way he was to blame 
but with a flaming anger he still blamed his brother officers of the court-martial who had not cleared his name and with a clean bill of health restored him to duty those were the men he blamed not ruff the sergeant who he believed had robbed him nor himself who in a passion of wounded pride had resigned and so had given reason for gossip but the men who had not in tones like a bugle call proclaimed his innocence who when they had handed him back his sword had given it grudgingly not with congratulation as he saw it he stood in a perpetual pillory when they had robbed him of his honour they had left him naked and life without honour had lost its flavour he could eat he could drink he could exist he knew that in many corners of the world white arms would reach out to him and men would beckon him to a place at table but he could not cross that little strip of turf between him and the chattering group on the veranda and hand his card to the admiral's orderly swanson loved life he loved it so that without help money or affection he could each morning have greeted it with a smile but life without honour he felt a sudden hot nausea of disgust why was he still clinging to what had lost its purpose to what lacked the one thing needful if life be an ill thing he thought i can lay it down the thought was not new to him and during the two past weeks of aimless wandering he had carried with him his service automatic to reassure himself he laid his fingers on its cold smooth surface he would wait he determined until the musicians had finished their concert and the women and children had departed and then then the orderly would find him where he was now seated sunken against the hawser post with a hole through his heart to his disordered brain his decision appeared quite sane he was sure he never had been more calm and as he prepared himself for death he assured himself that for one of his standard no other choice was possible thoughts of the active past or of what distress in the future his act would bring to others did not disturb him the thing had to be no one lost more heavily than himself and regrets were cowardly he counted the money he had on his person and was pleased to find there was enough to pay for what services others must soon render him in his pockets were letters cards a cigarette case each of which would tell his identity he had no wish to conceal it for of what he was about to do he was not ashamed it was not his act he would not have died by his own hand to his unbalanced brain the officers of the court-martial were responsible it was they who had killed him as he saw it they had made his death as inevitable as though they had sentenced him to be shot at sunrise a line from the drums of the fore and aft came back to him often he had quoted it when some one in the service had suffered through the fault of others it was the death cry of the boy officer devlin the knives of the ghazi had cut him down but it was his own people's abandoning him in terror that had killed him 
and so with a sob he flung the line at the retreating backs of his comrade you've killed me you cowards swanson nursing his anger repeated this savagely he wished he could bring it home to those men of the court-martial he wished he could make them know that his death lay at their door he determined that they should know on one of his visiting cards he pencilled to the officers of my court-martial you've killed me you cowards he placed the card in the pocket of his waistcoat they would find it just above the place where the bullet would burn the cloth the band was playing auf wiedersehen and the waltz carried with it the sadness that had made people call the man who wrote it the waltz king swanson listened gratefully he was glad that before he went out his last mood had been of regret and gentleness the sting of his anger had departed the music soothed and sobered him it had been a very good world until he had broken the spine of things it had treated him well far better he admitted than he deserved there were many in it who had been kind to whom he was grateful he wished there was some way by which he could let them know that as though in answer to his wish from across the parade ground the wireless again began to crash and crackle but now swanson was at a greater distance from it and the sighing rhythm of the waltz was not interrupted swanson considered to whom he might send a farewell message but as in his mind he passed from one friend to another he saw that to each such a greeting could bring only distress he decided it was the music that had led him astray this was no moment for false sentiment he let his hand close upon the pistol the audience now was dispersing the musicians were taking apart their music racks and from the steps of the vine-covered veranda admiral preble was bidding the friends of his wife adieu at his side his aide young alert confident with ill-concealed impatience awaited their departure swanson found that he resented the aid he resented the manner in which he speeded the parting guests even if there were matters of importance he was anxious to communicate to the chief he need not make it plain to the women-folk that they were in the way when a month before he had been adjutant in a like situation he would have shown more self-command he disapproved of the aid entirely he resented the fact that he was as young as himself that he was in uniform that he was an aide swanson certainly hoped that when he was in uniform he had not looked so much the conquering hero so self-satisfied so supercilious with a smile he wondered why at such a moment a man he had never seen before and never would see again should so disturb him in his heart he knew the aide was going forward just where he was leaving off the ribbons on the tunic of the aide the straps on his shoulders told swanson that they had served in the same campaigns that they were of the same relative rank and that when he himself had he remained in the service 
would have been a brigadier general the aide would command a battleship the possible future of the young sailor filled swanson with honourable envy and bitter regret with all his soul he envied him the right to look his fellow-man in the eye his right to die for his country to give his life should it be required of him for ninety million people for a flag swanson saw the two officers dimly with eyes of bitter self-pity he was dying but he was not dying gloriously for a flag he had lost the right to die for it and he was dying because he had lost that right the sun had sunk and the evening had grown chill at the wharf where the steamer lay on which he had arrived but on which he was not to depart the electric cargo lights were already burning but for what swanson had to do there still was light enough from his breast pocket he took the card on which he had written his message to his brother officers read and re-read it and replaced it safe for the admiral and his aide at the steps of the cottage and a bareheaded bluejacket who was reporting to them and the admiral's orderly who was walking towards swanson no one was in sight still seated upon the string piece of the wharf swanson so moved that his back was toward the four men the moment seemed propitious almost as though it had been prearranged for with such an audience for his taking off no other person could be blamed there would be no question but that death had been self-inflicted approaching from behind him swanson heard the brisk step of the orderly drawing rapidly nearer he wondered if the wharf were government property if he were trespassing and if for that reason the man had been sent to order him away he considered bitterly that the government grudged him a place even in which to die well he would not for long be a trespasser his hand slipped into his pocket with his thumb he lowered the safety catch of the pistol but the hand with the pistol in it did not leave his pocket the steps of the orderly had come to a sudden silence raising his head heavily swanson saw the man with his eyes fixed upon him standing at a salute they had first made his life unsupportable swanson thought now they would not let him leave it captain swanson sir asked the orderly swanson did not speak or move the admiral's compliments sir snapped the orderly and will the captain please speak with him still swanson did not move he felt that the breaking point of his self-control had come this impertinent interruption this thrusting into the last few seconds of his life of a reminder of all that he had lost this futile postponement of his end was cruel unhuman unthinkable the pistol was still in his hand he had but to draw it and press it close and before the marine could leap upon him he would have escaped from behind approaching hurriedly came the sound of impatient footsteps the orderly stiffened to attention the admiral he warned twelve years of discipline twelve years of recognition of authority twelve years of deference to superior officers 
dragged swanson's hand from his pistol and lifted him to his feet as he turned admiral preble the aide and the bareheaded bluejacket were close upon him the admiral's face beamed his eyes were young with pleasurable excitement with the eagerness of a boy he waved aside formal greetings my dear swanson he cried i assure you it's a most astonishing most curious coincidence see this man he flung out his arm at the blue jacket he's my wireless chief he was wireless operator on the transport that took you to manila when you came in here this afternoon he recognized you half an hour later he picks up a message picks it up two thousand miles from here from san francisco associated press news it concerns you that is not really concerns you but i thought we thought as though signalling for help the admiral glanced unhappily at his aide we thought you'd like to know of course to us he added hastily it's quite superfluous quite superfluous but the aide coughed apologetically you might read sir he suggested what exactly quite so cried the admiral in the fading light he held close to his eyes a piece of paper san francisco april twenty he read riff first sergeant shot himself here to-day leaving a written confession theft of regimental funds for which swanson captain lately court-martialed money found intact in ruff's mattress innocence of swanson never questioned but dissatisfied with findings of court-martial has left army brother officers making every effort to find him and persuade return the admiral sighed happily and my wife he added with an impressiveness that was intended to show he had at last arrived at the important part of his message says you are to stay for dinner abruptly rudely swanson swung upon his heel and turned his face from the admiral his head was thrown back his arms held rigid at his sides in slow deep breaths like one who had been dragged from drowning he drank in the salt chill air after one glance the four men also turned and in the failing darkness stood staring at nothing and no one spoke the aide was the first to break the silence in a polite tone as though he were continuing a conversation which had not been interrupted he addressed the admiral of course riff's written confession was not needed he said his shooting himself proved that he was guilty swanson started as though across his naked shoulders the aide had drawn a whip in penitence and gratitude he raised his eyes to the stars high above his head the strands of the wireless swinging from the towering masts like the strings of a giant aeolian harp were swept by the wind from the ocean to swanson the sighing and whispering wires sang in praise and thanksgiving end of the long arm by richard harding davis